We might be awaiting the Great Targaryen Civil War, but House of the Dragon has dished out yet another episode that dwells more on the build-up and strategizing. The sixth episode titled Small Folk is also a reminder of the grim consequences of war and its impact on the population. And on the other hand, we get a solid reality check on the nature of the dragons in the picture. No dragon is a plaything or a slave, and there couldn't have been a better explainer than this episode. In this video, we'll give you a thorough and detailed recap of the entire episode and also elaborate on the implications of the tricky ending. There'll be some major spoilers along the way, so Oh, you've been warned. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Wrong, but it does seem I am the Prince you. Regent, not a dog to be called to heal. Prince Aemon proves himself as an authoritative ruler. After Prince Aemon took over the reign of the kingdom following King Aegon's near-death experience and severe injuries, he's proven his credentials as a ruler who knows what he's doing. This episode starts off with a glimpse of the gallant Lannister army led by Jason Lannister and they arrive in the Riverlands. The sight of their glistening armor and fancy gear is bound to remind you of the glory and reputation of the Lannister army in the Game of Thrones series. However, Jason Lannister doesn't continue his march toward Harrenhal and demands Aemon join the fight with his dragon. It's interesting to see a caged lion brought by the Lannister forces, and we wonder if the lion is going to be used in the war and unleashed on the enemy. Surely they don't expect a lion to do much damage to a dragon. However, when the news of Jason Lannister's decision reaches Aemon, he doesn't take it too kindly. He lashes out during his council meeting and warns about harsh consequences for any form of disrespect to the king. I am a prince regent, not a dog to be put to heel. Aemon thunders, silencing everyone at the small council. He then orders Sir Criston to march from King's Landing with his forces, and the Lord of Castle Rock is ordered to march from the west. The plan is for the two forces to converge on Harrenhal. Hall, and Aemond intends to join them on his dragon when the time is right. It's also a part of his plan that the younger Lannister twin will form an alliance with the Triarchy, which is a pirate alliance between the free cities of Lys, Myr, and Tirosh. This will help them weaken the blockade enforced by the Sea Snake on Blackwater Bay. The show's trying to highlight Aemon's intelligence as well, because in the books, this strategy is the brainchild of Otto Hightower. It's also become quite clear that Aemond is in no mind to heed to the orders and instructions of his mother, Alison. After sowing seeds of dissent in her opinion during the council meeting, Aemon dismisses her from the small council. Alison is nearly distraught at how things are going for her, and it almost serves her right, as her son orders her to return to more domestic pursuits. Is King Aegon healing fast enough? Does he remember what happened to him? We finally see King Aegon in complete consciousness following his fatal injuries after he was barbecued by his brother Aemon's dragon, Vhagar. There are clear signs that his healing process has fastened, but we still don't know how soon he can be back to steady health. As of now, Maester Orwell points out that the king sleeps nine hours out of every ten, and we see Aegon in a world of pain, which is only temporarily eased by the milk of the poppy. Alicent pays him a tearful visit and apologizes to him as well, probably for failing to protect him from his own brother. By now, Every smart person in the small council is aware of how things went down between Aemon and Aegon. Later, even Aemon comes to see his brother, and it's a tense moment as Prince Aemon holds his small council stone against Aegon's chest and demands to know if he remembers what happened to him. It's almost torturous as Aegon moans in pain and manages to say that he remembers nothing at all. This is a smart move, because Aegon knows that his life currently hangs on a thin balance. If Aemon is convinced of any threat to his regime, he wouldn't hesitate to put an end to Aegon, and from the look on Aegon, we're quite convinced that he's back to his senses and remembers everything that happened to him. Daemon's tryst with the Harrenhal haunting continues. If there's one thing that irritates us the most about Season 2 of House of the Dragon, it's the almost comical narrative around Daemon and his experience at Harrenhal. While everyone prepares for battle and dragons are dying, our main man is busy battling his hallucinations and visions in the cold and wet halls of the Broken Castle. The saga continues in this episode as well, and this time Daemon has a vision of his brother King Viserys I as he gives his brother a piece of his mind. Viserys scolding Daemon has been a common feature of the first season, and this flashback just proves how impactful his elder brother has been. In fact, it even seems like Daemon only wants the power associated with the throne to secure love, affection, and respect from his elder brother, something that he seldom received back in the day. When Daemon tries to flee the throne room following this disturbing vision, he runs into Sir Simon Strong, who's rather confused by the panicking Daemon. All of a sudden, Daemon turns his frustration and anger on Sir Simon Strong, and accuses him of plotting against him or poisoning him in some manner. Surprisingly, Sir Simon is confident enough that he can talk Daemon out of it, and he eventually does. It's hilarious when he manages to shush the the mighty Daemon, and we hope that the troubled prince is back in his element soon enough. Following this traumatic hallucination, Daemon walks out of the castle and heads toward his dragon, Caraxes, but he encounters Alice Rivers at the Godswood, and this mysterious woman seems unfazed by his outburst. She's probably the one who has something to do with Daemon's condition, and it's funny how much control she has over him. She makes him understand how the throne is a burden to bear and not a price to be won, and it probably knocks some sense into Daemon, who's been rather disillusioned of late. He even seeks her advice in dealing with the Riverlords, and she tells him that the Riverlords will 
will never unite in the absence of their Lord Tully, because they're a proud group. Since Lord Tully is old and useless, Daemon doesn't have much to gain at the moment. Daemon seeks the help of Alice in this matter, and she confidently says that the winds will shift very soon. True to her words, Daemon receives the good news after a few days. While he's recovering from another vision of his brother Viserys mourning the death of his wife, he learns that Lord Grover Tully is dead. It's a clear hint for us that Alice Rivers had something to do with this. Daemon ends up weeping tears of joy, because finally, he can find a way to rally the support of the Riverlord. What is Larry Strong up to? Larry Strong, the master of whisperers, is a smart man who knows his way around the political web of the Targaryens. Currently, he's trying to influence Aemon just like he did for Aegon. However, Aemon's a tough nut to crack, and it's quite evident from their interactions. When Larys tries to remind Aemon that he needs a new hand, Sir Criston Cole was the hand to his brother Aegon, the latter dismisses his attempt to become the new hand. Instead, he asks him to summon Otto Hightower back to the city to serve as his new hand. This also proves that Aemon is not just whimsical and egoistic, but he also knows the importance of someone as wise and experienced as Otto Hightower as his advisor. However, we can't help but wonder what Larry Strong is up to. His loyalties have always been questionable, and now it seems like he just wants the best position of power available for himself. He even visits Aegon in his chambers after the snub, and instructs the nurse to withhold the milk of the poppy, because he wants to speak to Aegon while he still has a clear head. He gives Aegon a reality check about how he'll never be his old self again, and it's important to accept the same. Everyone will pity him and underestimate him. Larry even gives his own example to prove his point. We still don't know the purpose of his many motivational speech to Aegon, but he tries to make him understand that his handicap might eventually work to his advantage. The fear on Aegon's face is evident when Larys mentions the threat to his life during the rule of his brother. He whispers a cry of help to Larys, but the latter is probably keen on helping himself. His counsel to Aegon is probably keeping the future in mind, and he wants to be on the good books of the king in case he ever makes a comeback. We expect Larys Strong to play a key role in all the political turmoil, and so far, the show hasn't disappointed. Taming a dragon is easier said than done. Rhaenyra has realized the need for more dragon riders for the upcoming war, and she summons Sir Stefan Darklin as a potential candidate who can control a dragon. She's researched about his bloodline, and she believes that he has it in him to get the job done in this hour of crisis. Sir Darklin doesn't shy away from the challenge and bravely agrees to mount Sea Smoke. Initially, he approaches the dragon with caution and hesitation, but there comes a moment when the dragon almost seems like it will allow him to mount. However, his final approach proves to be disastrous, and Sea Smoke suddenly rises up and breathes out flames to kill him. In an inferno within seconds. The dragon then flies free, and it causes Rhaenyra to doubt her own decisions following the tragedy. Swords and dragons are not the only means to fight the war. While Aemon has taken over the control of King's Landing, Queen Rhaenyra continues to struggle in her efforts to win over the unquestionable support of the Lords at her small council. It doesn't help her cause that she picks the wrong man to tame a dragon, and it ends fatally. And it's a powerful scene when she slaps one of the Lords for his strong words against her actions. It is my fault that I think you have forgotten to fear me, she says in a powerful statement, and it's clear that Rhaenyra's had enough of insubordination. However, she strikes a crucial blow to the other side, courtesy of her brilliant advisor, Missaria. We'd learned of a plan to create a quick mutiny in King's Landing, and now the details of the plan are revealed. Boats full of food are sent for the inhabitants of the city, the small folk, and they've already been starving because of the siege. The plan works like a charm, and people are delighted to have the much-needed rations for survival. Someone even remarks that Rhaenyra hasn't forgotten about them, even though she's absent from King's Landing, and what follows is a frantic attempt to loot the supplies. Everyone tries to get their hands on some of the food and supplies, and even Hugh Hammer snatches a part of the catch from one of the citizens. It turns into a survival of the fittest contest, and the scent is clearly visible when people shout chants about Rhaenyra. She may have failed in securing a dragon rider for sea smoke, but Missouri is ensured that she has a slice of luck as well in the build-up to the war. Is Alicent experiencing guilt for her actions? Alicent's been in the wrong for so long that it's almost difficult to even call her a morally questionable character at this point. However, being snubbed by her own son, who she knows had something to do with immobilizing her other son, might have served her a reality check. We see her questioning herself during her interaction with her brother Sir Gawain Hightower as he prepares to ride out with Sir Criston Cole. Even Gawain's cocky arrogance seems to have disappeared after his experience during the Rook's Rest conflict. War changes people. And Gawain is almost compassionate toward his sister when she asks him about her youngest son Daeron, who was sent to Old Town as Gwen's ward when he was very young. She's glad to hear that Daeron has turned out to be kind, which hasn't been a quality in both her sons at King's Landing. Meanwhile, Sir Criston and Alicent share a long stare before the former heads out according to the King's orders. Suddenly, nothing is going according to Alicent, and she's losing the people she loves and cares for. The guilt in her voice and actions is evident, and we get a further taste of her fragile mental condition when she's confronted by the small folk. She orders the guards to sheathe their swords, even after a lump of cow's dung is hurled at her face, and she seems to have lost the ruthless aura around her. 
Public dissent can be as dangerous as war. The real horrors of war lie in the consequences and the way it impacts the lives of the commoners who have nothing to do with the conflicts in the first place. This golden rule holds true in the modern world just as much as it's relevant in the House of the Dragon universe. After the citizens of King's Landing are prevented from leaving and the blockade of the sea brings about a food shortage, the people are extremely unhappy with the rule. The idea to launch hundreds of boats with Targaryen banners and food in them proves to be a masterstroke, and the same commoners who were calling Rhaenyra a baby killer are not cheering for her return as the true queen. There's an impactful sequence where Helena and Alison are attacked by a disgruntled mob on their way back to the castle from a prayer. This scene will remind you of the time when King Joffrey was attacked by the angry citizens. The guards barely saved them and helped them get away in a carriage, but it shows just how dangerous an unruly mob can become. What are the implications of the emotional moment between Rhaenyra and Mizari? It's no secret that Mizari has been a blessing for Rhaenyra in these troubled times. Her plans have been out of the box, and more importantly, she's been a constant support system for the Queen every time she experiences any self-doubt. Something similar happens once again when Rhaenyra starts to believe that she can't really win the war, and Mizari offers her the right motivation to keep her chin. The two women share a passionate kiss, which is interrupted by a guard, but we wonder what the complications of this weak moment will be. This might seal Mizari's loyalty toward Rhaenyra and being a good thinker that she is, we'll expect some more brilliant plans from her along the way. It might also jeopardize the chances of reconciliation between Rhaenyra and Daemon, and Missaria's past affair with Daemon won't make things any easier. Does Rhaena have a major role coming up? We've seen in an earlier episode how Rhaena is given the responsibility of Rhaenyra's young ones as she sent away to Vale. As she roams around the mountainous terrain with Rhaenyra's young son, she notices a large patch of burnt earth, which is clearly the work of a fully grown dragon. When she confronts Lady Arryn about the same, she comes to know about a wild and formidable dragon that roams around Vale, and we sniff a possibility of a bigger role for the character of Rhaena. This wild dragon in question is none other than Sheepstealer. In the books, a girl named Nettles claims ownership of this dragon. We expect Rhaena to do the same in the show, given how Nettles hasn't even been introduced in the show. Sea Smoke gets a worthy rider. Rhaenyra and Mizaria's passionate kiss is broken up by a guard, who brings in a crucial piece of news about the dragon, Sea Smoke. It's revealed that Sea Smoke now has a rider, but the identity of this rider is still a mystery. Of course, we already know that the one who tamed Sea Smoke is Adam of Hull, the younger brother of Alan, both of whom are bastard sons of Corlys Velaryon. After the Sea Snake asks Alan to be his bosun, Adam encounters the large dragon. All of a sudden, he tries to get away, but Sea Smoke lands right in front of him, and it almost seems like the end of the story for Adam. However, it's quite the opposite, and it brings the attention back to the real nature of the dragons. In a way, the dragon chooses who it allows to mount the beast, and Adam seems to be the chosen one. It'll almost be poetic justice for Coralus Valarian when he learns about Adam's successful stint in claiming the dragon of his true-born son. These mighty creatures decide when to show affection, when to obey orders, and when to withhold both. This makes the upcoming Dragon War all the more interesting. Sea Smoke's been missing the bond with Lenor, and there still couldn't be a better way for the dragon to rediscover the bond with one of Coralus's bastard sons. A few more dragons are going to find worthy riders, and the entire procedure will be fun to observe. Where is Rhaenyra headed? Ending explained. After learning about the current status of Sea Smoke, we see Rhaenyra in what seems to be her first major offensive. She mounts Cyrax and flies away from Dragonstone, something that she's been prohibited from doing for so long. It's not revealed where she's headed, but this scene could be a subtle indication to the vicious dragon battles that are about to come up in the final few episodes of the season. It looks like she wants to deal with the challenge of the unknown dragon rider herself, and if things go as predicted, we can witness a great battle between Cyrax and Sea Smoke, and other dragons can get involved as well. It'll be a good time for Daemon to break out of his Harrenhal spell and make a real impact by siding with his queen at the right moment. Marvelous Verdict, a slow burner that can lead to a few action-packed episodes. The sixth episode of the second season, titled Small Folk, is probably the last of the intense strategizing that we see before an all-out war breaks out. If the next episode doesn't delve into the direct conflict, it's safe to say that the show is stalling because we need a couple of episodes in full gear to do justice to the magnitude of the Targaryen Civil War. We also expect more screen time for characters like Hugh Hammer and Adam and all the other potential dragon riders. There's been enough exploration of the characters and their innate features, and it's time to hit the nail on its head and make a solid impact. Do let us know in the comments below what you think of this episode, and also tell us about your views on what happens next in the unpredictable sequence of events. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if uh, you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.